Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure being here. This is actually my first time at uh, World Affairs Council in Foothill. I've been in Colorado several times at the other World Affairs Councils. I've noticed a bit of a pattern, though. I'm usually invited every five to six years. And I think it's because the topic I speak on is the Middle East. It tends to um, depress quite a lot of you. Uh, and as a result, it takes about five years before anyone is ready to listen to me again. <laughs> I'm hoping that today will be slightly more uplifting than my usual uh, conversations on the Middle East. But I will warn you, there's going to be elements of it as well that I think will leave you a bit concerned about where we are right now with the nuclear deal, what it means, what likely will happen in the next couple of weeks and months, and what could actually happen if this deal is either killed or collapsed. Um, this is my third book, incidentally, and like my previous two books, it's on the geopolitics of the Middle East. But with this one, I was really hoping that it would be a bit different, because the first two ones are uh, essentially systematically showing how diplomacy and negotiations were constantly missed or neglected, driving the situation between the United States and Iran in particular towards a military confrontation. With the third one, we actually do have what I would call a triumph of diplomacy, certainly not something that led to a peace, but something that really was quite uh, difficult to achieve in getting the different parties to the table and actually coming up with an agreement. And I was hoping that um, it would show what we can do when we actually pursue smart policies instead of having this um, constant urge to come across as being tough, letting uh, a little bit smarter policies lead the way and we actually do get different results. But then what happened was that a certain TV reality star won the presidency, and I ended up having to rewrite the last chapter of my book, and it started to become a little bit more like the previous books that once again showed how diplomacy was being neglected. Now, in these negotiations that took place over a course of about 20 months, I found myself in a rather unique situation. I was advising the Obama administration on the talks, and at the same time, because of my previous books, I had great access to the Iranian officials uh, and had an opportunity to constantly interview them and interact with them in the midst of the negotiations. It was not unusual that I could be at the White House early part of the week, and then end of the week I would fly out to Geneva or Lausanne, wherever the talks were taking place, and I would end up having a two-hour private conversation with the Iranian foreign minister, getting his perspective and how they're seeing things. And this was really... Sorry? All right. Um, and this was really amazing in the sense that I would be able to see both sides up front, see what their calculations were, what their concerns were, what their hopes were, what their strategies were. And I thought it would be valuable to actually document and tell the story, use this uh, front seat privilege that I had to tell the story of how an international crisis that literally was on the verge of war actually was resolved peacefully through negotiations, without a single shot being fired, and without a single angry 4 a.m. tweet being sent off. <laughs> and I think there's a lot that we can learn from this now, particularly when it comes to the situation in North Korea, in which we, it's even more dangerous than what the situation was with Iran, mindful of the North Korean capabilities. Um, but these negotiations were at the end of the day, this entire deal, is not just about the nuclear deal. It is truly a matter of war and peace. It's about the geopolitics of the Middle East. That's why this conflict is continuing even after the deal was struck. And that's where I want to begin. I want to take you to April 2012 in a very, very small country in Europe. Um, a most unusual group of people gathered. This is in the midst of a moment where the United States is pursuing very, very harsh, crippling sanctions on Iran. The Iranians are aggressively going forward with their nuclear program. The Israelis are making weekly threats of taking preemptive military action. And in the midst of this, a most unusual group of people gathered. This group included five Iranian officials, including two people who were from the nuclear negotiating team several senior American officials, including a very, very senior American general, and perhaps most surprisingly, five senior Israelis. 
at a time when the Israelis and the Iranians certainly didn't talk to each other, didn't even recognize each other, it was quite unusual to have these people in the same room. But what was being said was actually even more shocking. Let me give you a quote. This is not about enrichment. This was never about enrichment. This is quite stunning. The Israeli official is looking straight across the room, looking into the eyes of the Iranians and saying, this whole ordeal about the nuclear issue that the Israelis had defined as an existential threat to Israel for the last 20 years, which was centered on the nuclear issue, actually was not about the nuclear issue. Instead, he goes on to explain, Israel needs to see a sweeping attitude change on behalf of Iran, and explains it as such. The Israelis could not accept that Iran was not accepting Israel's existence, and once again raising questions about whether Israel had a right to exist or not. And it could not accept that the United States, the closest ally of Israel, would strike a deal with Iran, come to terms with Iran, without Iran coming to terms with Israel. If that were to happen, the Israelis believed, it would essentially leave Israel abandoned. The United States would overcome at least a big portion of its tensions with Iran, and then it would move on to other issues. There's plenty of crises around the world. But Israel would be stuck in the Middle East, still facing a hostile Iran, but now without the full backing of the United States. And as a result, he made it clear, in no uncertain terms, Israel would do everything it could to stand in the way of a nuclear deal for that very reason, because of avoiding a scenario in which the United States and Iran came to terms without making a request that the Iranians had to change their position on Israel. This was not just a moment of honesty, it was a moment of utmost clarity about what some of the actual driving forces of this conflict was about. Very different from what you would be hearing either on CNN on this end or Fox News on the other end. This issue was far more complex, in some ways perhaps less complex than the nuclear issue. Now, in order to better understand exactly the meaning of what the Israelis were saying and explaining, we have to go back a little bit further. So bear with me. I'm going to take you back to 1991. You had two major geopolitical shocks that year. You had the collapse of the Soviet Union, and you had Saddam Hussein's Iraq being defeated by the United States and the UN coalition. On a global scale, that meant that now the United States was the sole superpower of the world. On a regional scale, it meant that the old balance of power in the Middle East had now been disrupted, and it was not clear what it would be replaced with. And whenever you have these situations, Powerful countries see it as either as a threat or an opportunity to be able to redefine or to protect their role. In this specific situation, it had a deep impact on the relationship between Iran and Israel. The Iranians and the Israelis, most people don't know, were actually having a close uh, security collaboration throughout the 1980s. It started during the time of the Shah, and it started because the two countries felt a common geostrategic dilemma. They faced common threats. They were both very worried about strong Arab nationalist countries such as Egypt under Nasser or Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and they both sensed a strong threat from the Soviet Union, precisely because the Soviet Union was arming and supporting those Arab states. This commonality created a very strong relationship behind the scenes that actually survived the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And after the Islamic Revolution, when the Iranians were using the most hostile rhetoric against Israelis. In the 80s, the Israelis were actually the ones lobbying Washington to talk to Iran, to sell arms to Iran, and not pay attention to Iranian rhetoric because the rhetoric was actually not reflective of the real policies that were being pursued. By 1991-92, all of that changes. A new geopolitical environment emerges, one in which the Soviet Union has now essentially collapsed, and Iraq is now, also now defeated a new geopolitical constellation in which two of the more powerful states in the region emerging was actually Iran and Israel. And they started viewing each other no longer as partners, but as security rivals. And one of the most important things was, how do you define the new balance of power and the new order in the region? The Israelis were the ones who moved first. 
recognizing that the United States might move closer to Iran in this post because Iran had helped the U.S. against Iraq, the Israelis make the argument that for Israel to be able to take a risk for peacemaking with the Palestinians, the United States needs to isolate and contain the new threat to the region, which was Iran. At first, the United States was a little bit surprised by this, but by the, the second years of the Clinton administration, they bought into this and they formed a, a new order, a new policy for the region that was called dual containment. The new balance in the region, the new order, would be based on Iraq and Iran's dual containment. Both of them would be isolated. And at the center of this order would be Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. For the Israelis and the Saudis, this was great. For the Iranians, they absolutely hated it. They were hoping that after uh, collaborating with the US against Saddam, they would come out of their uh, isolation and that, that they had caused themselves because of their radicalism, and that there would be an opportunity for them to be able to reemerge as an accepted power in the region. Instead, the United States doubles down on Iran's isolation and imposes new sanctions. The Iranians did everything they could to cause the collapse of this new order, including targeting what they saw as the weakest link of the American-Israeli strategy, which was the peace process. If the peace process collapsed, none of the other strategic objectives of the United States and Israel could be achieved, they calculated. So they supported Hamas, Islamic Jihad, all of these different groups that were using violence against Israel. But despite everything the Iranians did to cause the collapse of this order, it was not the Iranians that put an end to dual containment. It was actually the United States itself. By George W. Bush deciding to go into Iraq, he by definition ended dual containment and he disrupted the balance that had existed, the American balance that had existed. His hope, of course, was to recreate the region and make sure that hostile states were gone and the US would, U.S. would have an easier time controlling the region. But instead, it was a miserable failure. And instead of being able to recreate a new balance, all that it did was that it destroyed the old balance. And ever since, the region has essentially been orderless. There is no one single hegemon in the region that can call the shots. There is no combination of states in the region that can call the shot and establish that balance. And that's precisely why we're seeing so much warfare and instability in the Middle East. Because the region has, is in the process of transitioning from one equilibrium to the next. And that, by definition, is the most unstable periods of a system. We don't know where we are on that transition. We just know that we are not having a balance right now. Now, for the Iranians, for the Israelis and the Saudis, this was a disaster. They enjoyed maximum maneuverability under dual containment. They essentially had, um, their rivals were contained by the United States. The US was very strong in the region, uh, providing them with their uh, security without them necessarily having to do that much. For the Iranians, this was um, essentially, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A blessing in disguise. On the one hand, of course, the, uh, the Bush administration was very hostile to Iran, but because the US had weakened itself to the point in which it no longer could enforce a new equilibrium on the Middle East, the Iranians were now unleashed. Iraq was gone, the Taliban in Afghanistan had been defeated, two of Iran's immediate enemies, and as a result, they could now spread their influence. But despite them now facing a much more beneficial geopolitical circumstance, they could not lock in this new balance unless they could get the United States to negotiate with Iran and recognize Iran as a major power in the region. And for that very precise reason, the Israelis opposed any diplomacy between the United States and Iran, fearing that it would lead to some sort of accommodation between the two that would recognize that Iran is a power in the region. Ironically, however, the Israelis and the Iranians ended up using the exact same instrument to achieve their opposite objectives, which was the nuclear program. From the Israeli perspective, the nuclear program was this menacing program defined as an existential threat combined with the Israelis pushing for a line that essentially was making uh, any compromise between the two sides impossible, 
And that specific line was that they said there can absolutely not be any enrichment in Iran. Enrichment technology in Iran has to be completely wiped out. This was impossible to achieve. And if you have an impossible objective and you define the threat as existential, this would inevitably lead to the United States at some point having to take military action against Iran. And the balance of power that would emerge out of that war, the Israelis calculated, would be beneficial to Israel because Iran would have been defeated. The Iranians had the opposite calculation. Yes, certainly, uh, moving forward with a nuclear program in the aggressive manner that they did certainly could spark a war. But precisely because of the Iraq war that had weakened the US, that had turned the American public against war, there was also a chance, they thought, that if they actually go forward with the program, the United States would be forced to change its position on enrichment and start negotiating with the Iranians and recognizing them as the power that they wanted to be. And that's the dilemma the United States faced. How to prevent Iran from actually having a nuclear weapon, how to prevent the Israelis from starting a war that the US believed would be disastrous, and how to prevent the Iranians to be in a position in which they could define the balance of power in the region after a negotiation, if a negotiation were to take place. These were the, different, these were the challenges that the United States was facing. Now, the Bush administration pursued um, a rather different strategy. Their idea was that the US simply will not negotiate. It will insist on zero enrichment, as the Israelis wanted, and pursue pressure, sanctions, coercion, and other uh, means of essentially forcing the Iranians to capitulate. The track record of that policy is quite clear. In 2003, the Iranians had roughly 150 centrifuges. Those are the machines that spin around and you use them to enrich uranium. By the time Bush left office, Iran had 8,000 centrifuges. Iran had no, zero stockpile of low enriched uranium. That's what you would use either for fuel rods for a reactor, or if you enrich it further, you would use it for weapons. Zero. By the time Bush left office, Iran had 1,500 kilos of low enriched uranium, enough to be able to produce one nuclear weapon. Clearly, a different strategy was needed. So when Obama comes in, he's already running on a platform of trying to reconstitute, reinstitute, um, diplomacy at the center of American statecraft. And it wasn't just diplomacy with Iran, it was with Cuba, it was with Venezuela. Um, but he quickly learned that it is much easier to talk about diplomacy with Iran when you're a state senator in Illinois than to actually conduct it when you are president. And his first attempt in 2009 ended up being a failure, mainly because of problems on the Iranian side. But within a year, Obama was now faced with the same situation as Bush was, and with the same instruments that Bush had at his disposal. Sanctions, cyber warfare, coercion, sabotage, all different types of pressure tactics, but no real diplomacy. But precisely because Obama had tried diplomacy, which Bush had not, and precisely because he enjoyed a degree of international legitimacy, which compared to Bush was far greater, of course, he could achieve what Bush couldn't which was that he managed to impose on Iran probably the strongest sanctions regime any country yet has faced. The United States even imposed sanctions on Iran's central bank, effectively cutting it off the entire international financial system. The week that happened, the Iranian currency dropped roughly 30 to 50%. Riots broke out in Iran for roughly two days. Uh, the GDP contracted roughly 25% over the course of three and a half, four years as a result of all of this massive economic pressure. Uh, Obama even managed to convince the Europeans to impose sanctions on Iran and completely end all of their oil sales from Iran. Iran used to sell 40% of its oil to Europe, went down to zero. This was absolutely devastating and clearly the Iranians had underestimated Obama. They never thought that he would be able to get such a strong sanctions regime. But Obama had also underestimated the Iranians. Clearly they were hurting, but they were not breaking. 
nor were they without a response. In fact, their response was the exact mirror image of the American strategy. If the American strategy was we're going to sanction and pressure Iran in order to change its cost-benefit analysis so that it concludes that it's simply not worth it to go forward with this nuclear program. Because at some point, they would reach a point in which they would have to ask themselves, do you want to have a nuclear program or do you want to have an economy? And their aim was to get them to capitulate on the issue of enrichment. The Iranian calculation was exactly the same. If the United States disapproved of enrichment and of Iran having centrifuges, the Iranians were going to double down and expand their nuclear program to convince the United States that sanctions were not worth it, that their sanctions actually would beget the United States even more centrifuges, even bigger of an Iranian nuclear program. And here you had this race, this three-way race that got created between the Iranian clock, the nuclear clock in which they were trying to present the United States and the world with a nuclear fait accompli, the sanctions clock in which the United States was essentially trying to collapse the Iranian economy and force them to capitulate, and then you had the wild card of an Israeli clock in which perhaps Bibi Netanyahu would take military action and that would, of course, dramatically change the situation. As these clocks were ticking, you had the official negotiations taking place at uh, various cities. Nothing really interesting was happening in these. Uh, there was no compromise that was made by either side. The packages they were presenting each other were quite um, embarrassing in, in, in how little actually was put on the table. And the president was convinced by a senator at the time that you're not going to be able to get anything done in this track. You have to open up a direct secret channel to the Iranians headed by the Iranian supreme leader. Only there would you be able to get the Iranians to potentially compromise. That sen senator was J John Kerry, who later on, of course, ended up becoming Secretary of State. He had played a key role in securing the release of three American hikers. Uh, you all probably heard of the three American hikers who got imprisoned in Iran. Um, slight footnote, they were, you know, they hiked once in their life and now they're always known to be the hikers. <laughs> they're actually school teachers, journalists, very, very accomplished people. Um, and they ended up, uh, they were based in various places in the Middle East. I think Sarah was in uh, Damascus and they decided to go to Iraqi Kurdistan and to go some hiking. And they went to an area that is very close to the Iranian border and they actually technically never actually really went into Iran. They were walking there in this place where the border is unmarked. They saw a couple of soldiers who waved them over. As they went over, unbeknownst to them, they crossed into Iran. They got arrested by these soldiers who accused them of spying. John Kerry worked with the government of Oman to be able to create a channel and get their release, which I think took five, six hundred days to do so, but eventually he got them out. And the Omanis did this because they wanted to prove to the United States that they have the capacity of maneuvering the Iranian political landscape. And they wanted to prove that because they wanted the United States to use their services to resolve the nuclear issue because they were terrified that this would lead to a military confrontation. So Secret Channel was set up. The president was convinced. And in July 2012, the first meeting was held in the capital of uh, Oman, which is Muscat. From the American side, three people went, two mid-level people and one junior to them. The Iranians sent a couple of additional people. This is the first time they actually had a closed meeting. Um, but it was a failure by all accounts. From the American side, the purpose of this meeting was essentially twofold. We wanted to see, is this an authoritative channel? Does this channel actually have the blessing of the Iranian supreme leader? There's no value negotiating with folks that don't have a mandate to negotiate. They're just you know, freelancing and wanted to have a free trip to Muscat. The other thing was to see how close are the Iranians to capitulating? How much has that pressure bitten them so far? The Iranians came for a completely different reason. They came to see how close is the United States to capitulate on the issue of enrichment. So for a full day, they were essentially talking past each other. The Iranians were peppering the Americans with various formulations on how the U.S. could accept enrichment. The American side had no authority to even get into conversations of substance of that kind. 
to the two sides left, disappointed and increasingly worried about the situation. Then you had the elections in the United States in November, but by January 2013, a completely new sense of urgency dawned on the White House. Exactly a year earlier, January 2012, then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta had publicly stated that Iran's breakout capability is 12 months. That's a measurement in which you essentially say, from the moment the Iranians would make a political decision to build a nuclear bomb, to them having the material ready, not just low enriched uranium, but actually enriching the uranium much higher, it would take them 12 months from making the decision to having the material. And that's not even counting, you know, testing it and putting it on a missile or anything like that. 12 months. By January 2013, their breakout capability had shrunk to 8 to 12 weeks. Clearly, the nuclear clock was ticking faster than the sanctions clock. And the president realized that if we just continued on the path that we were on, the United States would soon face only two options. Either it would have to go to war with Iran, or it would have to accept Iran as a de facto nuclear power, unless something changed. So as a result, they decided to go back to Oman. But this time it was very different. March 2013. But now, they're sending a full delegation, headed by the number two person at the State Department, which was at the time Ambassador Bill Burns. A full delegation of senior non-proliferation experts. And the Iranians do the same. They send their deputy foreign minister. But this time, for the very, very first time, the American side, the American diplomats were armed with an instrument that they had not even been allowed to touch before, which was a very, very carefully crafted statement on how the United States, under what circumstances, it would be willing to accept enrichment on Iran. This was the core point of difference. This was the uh, uncompromising red line for the Iranians, that they were not willing to do anything unless the Americans accepted this. And this was exactly the thing the Israelis absolutely opposed the United States doing. But realizing that if nothing changed, this would lead to war, the president, who always had planned to play it at some point, but at the end of the negotiation, now played it in the very beginning of the negotiations to actually get negotiations. This was a major breakthrough. But he actually didn't break through. Despite the fact that the two sides had moved so much closer on substance, 35 years of mistrust between the United States and Iran still made it very difficult for them to actually be able to capitalize on this opening. The Iranians mistrust the US just as much as the US mistrust Iran. And the Iranians could not go back to Tehran and say, hey, the Americans promised it would accept enrichment. They needed to have it in writing. The Americans were not allowed to put it in writing because if this leaked, it would create all kinds of problems, including collapsing the formal talks that was taking place at the Security Council level because the Europeans, no one knew about this. The Europeans were in these endless, extremely excruciating negotiations for no reason because the real action was taking place in Oman. So it's critical that this was not put in writing. So once again, the two sides were stuck. And then someone came up with the idea. Who in this world is capable of bridging the trust between the United States and Iran, between the President of the United States and the Supreme Leader of Iran? Who has that capacity of bridging that trust? Who is their shared Facebook friend that could come in and talk some sense to the both sides? Essentially, there's only one person that they could think of, and that's the Sultan of Oman, a very strong ally of the US, and also someone who historically has enjoyed very close relations with the Iranians. So the idea came that if the United States cannot put this in writing and send it to the Iranians, perhaps the US can write a letter to the Sultan and detail the American position in a letter to the head of the Omani government. And then the Sultan, in between his chemotherapy, would travel to Tehran, meet face to face with the Supreme Leader of Iran, not show him the letter, but convey to him the contents of the letter. And that way, if the Iranians objected, it wouldn't be because they're mistrusting the US. They would actually be saying that they're mistrusting 
this Sultan of Oman, someone who they have deep respect for and who they couldn't express this for. And that's how this actually was resolved. And incidentally, all of this is taking place while Ahmadinejad is still present. He was opposed to this process, but it was all taking place before Rouhani got elected. I wanted to mention this part of it, not only to be able to show what kind of uh, creative methods you have to use in diplomacy to get over uh, hurdles and obstacles, but also to point out that in this era in which we hear so much about Sunni Shia tensions and Arab Persian tensions, it was actually an Arab country that brought the United States and Iran closer together. Secondly, the United States could not have done this without friends. And right now, we have to think a little bit extra about how we're treating our friends in order to make sure that they can help us when situations of this kind show up. After this breakthrough, the world got lucky. Uh, Iran had elections. Rouhani got elected. A completely different team of diplomats come in. They change the language to English. They start being civil to each other. And it takes yet another 15 or so months before they actually have a final deal, which they reach in July 2015. I have all the details in the book. I'm going to skip through some of that. But I can just tell you, in the most simplest form, the deal secured two twin objectives. It closed off all pathways for Iran to be able to develop a nuclear weapon. And it also closed off the option of, or the outcome of the US and Iran going to war with each other. We can talk more about the details of the deal, and uh, I'll be happy to address any of the criticism that you may have heard. But let me leave you with two last points. First one is that throughout all of these negotiations, Bibi Netanyahu, precisely for the reasons that I explained earlier, positioned himself as the foremost opponent of this nuclear agreement. He even went as far as to give a speech in Congress against the sitting president of the United States, which was completely unprecedented. But in many ways, this deal didn't come about despite Netanyahu, but frankly, because of Netanyahu. Let me explain why. Netanyahu deliberately wanted to eliminate the status quo option, the option in which the United States would just contain the nuclear program and then kick the can down the road and let it be the headache of the next administration. Essentially what we've been doing on North Korea for some time. We don't have a solution, so we just contain it and hope that time, something will change and, and we just push it forward. He deliberately wanted to eliminate that option because if the status quo option didn't exist, the United States would be forced to act. He thought that he would be forcing the United States to act militarily. He underestimated Obama and that Obama actually would really dwell into the diplomacy. Had Netanyahu not eliminated the status quo option, I personally am not convinced that President Obama would have made the investment in diplomacy that he ended up doing. He did it because he understood that if he didn't, he would have to go to war. But Netanyahu essentially made that choice easier for him by changing the structure of the situation. The other thing is that despite everything he did to try to sabotage a deal, there was one very, very simple thing he could have done that most likely would have caused the collapse of the negotiations. Instead of going in front of the cameras and saying, this is the worst deal ever, this is the deal of the century for the Iranians, um, we're giving freebies to the Iranians, he should have just gone in front of the cameras and said the opposite. We in Israel love this deal. This is the best deal ever. This is Iran's defeat. This is Iran's capitulation. I interviewed Zarif and I asked him, what would, you, what, would, what would you have done if Netanyahu hugged the deal? And he said, oh, I would have walked out. He could not handle Netanyahu saying that this is a bad deal for Iran. Because the criticism he would be facing in Iran from conservative circles would be so intense that it would be impossible for him to continue the negotiations. He had no problem handling Netanyahu saying that this is an awesome deal for Iran. He actually helped shut up his critics inside of Iran. But in all of the things Netanyahu did, he never figured out that there was this very, very simple formula that he could have used. Last point I'll make before we break and take questions is that a lot of people ask what, you know, critics say that there was a better deal that could be had. Um, the, the current president says that there's a better deal that could be had. And the Obama administration's response was, no, this was the best deal that you possibly could have gotten. I actually think there was a better deal. It was a much better deal. But that deal didn't exist in 2015. That deal existed much, much earlier. Let me give you some numbers. 
In 2003, as I mentioned, the Iranians had 164 centrifuges. They actually sent an offer to negotiate with the Bush administration in March of that year. The Swiss ambassador to Iran delivered that proposal to the US. Um, I worked in Congress at the time. We got a copy of it because my boss had lived in Iran during the 1970s and was the only Farsi-speaking member of Congress. He knew Karl Rove, and the Swiss ambassador gave it to my boss because he wanted to make sure the president saw it, that it wouldn't just die in the State Department. He sent off a page over to deliver to the White House. Two hours later, Karl Rove calls. He says that he is, um, um, he was quite uh, taken by the proposal. He wanted to know uh, if it was authentic. And we said, well, it came from the Swiss. Their job tasked by the US is to only pass forward proposals that they have vetted and verified. And he said that he was um, quite intrigued by it. And that's the last thing we heard until four months later was an article in the Financial Times that said that some sort of a peace offer had been made by the Iranians. And the Bush administration's response was to reprimand the Swiss ambassador for having delivered it in the first place. By 2005, the Iranians sent the last negotiation offer to the Europeans prior to Ahmadinejad becoming president. And then they offered to cap their program at 3,000 centrifuges. I remember at the White House in one of the meetings when we were trying to figure out where the US thinks it's going to land on the centrifuge issue, someone raised that proposal and said, you think you're going to be able to achieve that number. And one of the negotiators laughed and said, you know, we would jump on that proposal if it existed today. But that ship has sailed. We're constantly chasing the deal we could have gotten two years ago. A couple of months later, I'm in Lausanne. I'm interviewing Zarif. And I ask him the same question. Do you think you're going to keep as many as you offered in 2005, uh, the 3,000? Or do you think you're going to get more or less? And he thought for a while. He actually wrote that proposal. He was like, 3,000? Oh. That was just an opening bid. We were going to settle for 1,000 centrifuges. By the time the US struck a deal, the interim deal in November 2013, the Iranians had 22,000 centrifuges. They had 10,000 kilos of low enriched uranium, 190 kilos of medium enriched uranium. This is the track record of pursuing unachievable, unrealistic objectives and only putting all of our eggs in the coercion and pressure basket. If we had a more flexible position on the issue of enrichment, which most observers at the time said, there's no way you're going to be able to get them to agree to zero. It's just not going to happen. If we had a more flexible position earlier, we could definitely have gotten a better deal. By 2015, I agree with the Obama administration. I don't think there was much better. But I think the lesson for us, particularly now when we're faced with a very, very dangerous situation with North Korea is to make sure that we have a balanced approach, that we don't put all our eggs in coercion and, and tough talk. Because in the case of Iran, at least, that ended up winning them time. They had 10 more years of their program. And forget about the numbers of centrifuges and the kilos of LEU. The amount of know-how that they gained during that period, you can never get rid of. And this is something I think we have to be very careful. And it goes back to what I said earlier on. When we let smart policy take over instead of this desire to constantly look tough. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, just a, uh, a question on what's your outlook today. <laughs> Thank you. I knew someone would ask a question that would leave you guys depressed. <laughs> My outlook right now is very, very grim. Um, Trump, I think, uh, I'll be very blunt and frank, I don't think he understands the deal. I don't think there's any problem with the deal itself that he's really concerned about. This is mostly about the fact that this deal has Obama's signature on it. Um, and this is the main motivating factor. That doesn't mean that there isn't legitimate criticism against the deal, nor is it that there aren't people in his administration that actually have those legitimate criticism as their main opposition to the deal. But when it comes to Trump himself, I don't think he has anything to do with those factors. I think it's about the fact that this is Obama's deal, and he has uh, strong antipathy towards that. So for instance, you all know that every three to four months, he has to certify to Congress whether Iran is living up to the deal or not. 
there's the, the body that actually polices the deal is called the International Atomic Energy Agency. They have issued nine reports. The Iranians are apparently living up to the deal. Uh, to the T, there's no problem. Everything the IAEA has asked for access for, they have gotten. But then there's an internal American mechanism between Congress and the President in which Congress said, well, we want to report from you as well every three months. And this was part of the reason because Obama didn't, no one agreed to make this a treaty, so it wouldn't have to be ratified by any parliament. So Congress was like, look, we have an oversight uh, requirement, so we're going to still put something in there. And they put into place INARA, which then requires that every three months he writes a report to Congress and says whether the deal is working or not. To Trump, this is like a recurring three-month insult that he has to certify that something Obama did actually is working. So in some of the negotiations in Congress, the issue had, it actually became quite clear. He would be OK with the deal as long as he doesn't have to certify it to Congress. As long as he doesn't have to go there every three months and say, yes, it's working, he would be having far less problems with the deal. And this is where you can see, look, where the problem really lies. It's not whether the Iranians kept too many centrifuges or if, if the, de you know, the, um, the restrictions are severe enough or if they expire too early, et cetera. It's about that issue. What is happening right now, though, is that I think the administration has figured out a way for them to kill the deal, but to kill it slowly without having, the, without them looking guilty and having to pay the cost and the responsibility. Let me explain why that is. When Trump, we've seen now three or four times, we have no idea whether he's going to certify the deal or not, whether he's going to renew the waivers or not. Tillerson doesn't know. Mattis doesn't know until the last minute. Well, I think by the third time, it's quite clear. This is a deliberate strategy. Because this means that he is infusing maximum uncertainty into the situation. No one knows what's going to happen. How is this undermining the deal? Well, part of the incentives for the Iranians to agree to restrict their program. You know, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, from the 22,000 centrifuges that they had, they went down to 5,000 which is still 2,000 more than their opening bid in 2000, but nevertheless, a significant reduction. In return, sanctions were supposed to be lifted, and Iran would be reintegrated into the global economy again. Well, what do businesses want in order to be able to enter a market? Certainty. The Iranians have massive investment projects, companies that come and sign them. No bank is willing to finance it. These projects are five, seven, 10 years long. But these banks don't know if Trump is going to renew the waivers four months from now. So as long as that uncertainty is taking place, it is actually a de facto sanction. And he has ensured that a very, very small number of projects actually have taken place. The economy in Iran is in very bad shape. We saw the riots and protests just a month or so ago, which is mainly because of unemployment and the mismanagement and corruption. Uh, of the government itself, but it's not unrelated to the fact that they haven't gotten any investments coming in, which is that, that's the key thing they need to be able to create jobs. So even if he renews the waiver next time and the time after that, if he continues on this current path of constantly keeping the world guessing and then saying, well, this is going to be the last time I do it, that's actually enough to kill this deal. Because there's going to be a point in which the Iranians are going to be like, well, they're not getting what they were promised. And the public opinion already is turning against the deal in Iran. The political opinion is going to turn against the deal. And at that point, we may have a much worse situation, which is the Iranians start cheating on the program. That's going to be a disastrous situation. Imagine one of the first steps they might take. They might restrict the IEA's access to their nuclear program. And the headline will be, Iran kicks out inspectors. Once you have that headline, rest assured, the drumbeats of war are going to start beating again. And that is the consequence if this deal goes away. To believe that we can get rid of this deal and still not have to face the, the difficulties that we faced in 2011, 2012 with a nuclear program that could turn into a weapons program is pure fantasy, I think. Next question. Uh, since Europe was a major part of the deal, why can't they continue with the agreement Technology in Germany and the other countries uh, would be very beneficial to Iran, and then just have the U.S. be irrelevant in that case. <laughs> um, your point is an absolute excellent one, and this is one of the few 
possible chances that the deal can survive even if the U.S. walks out. But I would still put that as a very slow, a low likelihood for a very simple reason. The governments in Europe are actually currently considering counter sanctions on the U.S. That's where we have come to. Europe is considering sanctioning the United States. Because essentially, if the deal collapses, that means that the U.S. is going to reimpose its sanctions. Those sanctions are not targeting Iran. They're targeting companies trading with Iran, European companies, Chinese companies, etc. And in order to protect the deal and for the Europeans to continue to be active, they're considering sanctioning the U.S. if the U.S. sanctions European companies. Even if they were to take this massive political step, which they absolutely don't like to do, why on earth would they want to have a trade war with the U.S.? Right? But even if they were to do so, it doesn't mean that the companies will choose to go into the Iranian market. Because the companies, many of them are going to be faced with a choice. Do you want to go into the Iranian market or do you want to be active in the American market? And they're going to choose to stay in the American market. And even if they can, even if their government protects them, they'll still stay out of the Iranian market. End result, the Iranians are not getting the economic benefit. And at some point, they'll start break out of the deal as well. So it's definitely something that people are considering right now and hoping to see perhaps that can work. I'm still not convinced that it can work because it's not about the political will of the government. It's whether actually the economic flow is happening the way that it was promised. We have a question right here. There's been some talk about Iraq, I mean Iran developing a, a ballistic missile program that is one of the problems that the Trump administration is having with this deal. Could you talk about what that program is about and what the issue is? Absolutely. So um, the Iranians have a ballistic missile program. Let me actually ask this, just to put things in context a little bit, because I think this is oftentimes misunderstood. What do you think Iran's military budget is? Give me a wild guess. Over there. OK, we have five over here. Do we have anything else? <laughs> 10? 15? One. One, okay. It's 15. Good job. What is Saudi Arabia's military budget? 100. It was 80 and it's gone down to 56, but it's somewhere between 50 and 80. Saudi Arabia has a military budget several times the size of Iran. So does the UAE. The Israelis have probably doubled the size of the Iranians. The Iranians are spending far less on military than uh, almost every other country in the region, uh, even those who are much, much smaller and have populations that are dwarfed by the size of Iran. Yet we hear far more, of course, about the Iranian program. That's not to say that they are entitled or that it's right that they're doing it. It's just to point out that it's much easier to make this argument that this is a very threatening program when we know so little about what the others have. The Saudis have missile programs that actually have a longer reach than the Iranians have. So do the Israelis. What's the problem then? Well. The problem is that the missile program that the Iranians have was included in the Security Council resolution earlier on when sanctions were imposed on Iran, not because of the missiles, but because there was a suspicion that the Iranians were developing nuclear weapons. And the combination of nuclear weapons and missiles was the problem. Once the nuclear issue was resolved, automatically the missile issue should have been out of the Security Council resolution because there is no international treaty that the Iranians have signed that they have agreed to have their missile program regulated. They have signed a non-proliferation treaty, which means that they have forsworn not to have nuclear weapons. So they can be beholden to that agreement. There's no missile program. So as a result, it shouldn't have been there. But the Obama administration managed to nevertheless get a mention of it, much weaker language. Um, and so it's still in there. But so when they're doing these tests, the Trump administration can say that it's violating the spirit of the deal. They can't say that it's a violation of the agreement because that resolution says that Iran shall uh, um, calls on Iran not to test missiles that are designed to carry nuclear weapons. Calls on is not shall not, so it's a much weaker language. And it should be missiles that are designed to carry nuclear weapons, which these are not. Nevertheless, it's an issue. Now, why do the Iranians have it? Well, part of the reason for this is because of what happened during the Iraq-Iran War. During the Iraq-Iran War, the Iranian military, which was almost entirely based on American military, 
uh, American weaponry. Uh, the Shah was spending more money than the Saudis are today on American weaponry. He loved buying American weapons. But as soon as the revolution happened and the Iranians were foolish enough to take 52 Americans hostage, diplomats, the US imposed an arms embargo, which meant that they no, lo no longer had access to American spare parts. So their entire military more or less essentially was stranded as a result of this. Saddam had very advanced weapons. He could hit Tehran from the western point of Iraq. Iran did not have missiles, so long distance missiles. They had to be inside of Iraq in order to be able to hit Baghdad in this war of the cities that existed in 1986. After that, and because Iran continued to be isolated, they decided that what they would do as their deterrence, instead of building a, uh, an air force that would be very strong, which they couldn't do because no one was really selling them, they invested instead in missiles. Yet their missiles are still less advanced than what other countries in the region have. What this comes down to at the end of the day is this. If you are unhappy about the shifting balance of power in the region, and you're unhappy that the United States ended dual containment and is no longer in a position to reimpose an equilibrium in the region that contains Iran, then you will look for various issues as, I wouldn't call it pretext, but as instruments to be able to put Iran back into a position of isolation. With a nuclear issue essentially being eliminated, the focus has now shifted to other things, missiles, Iran's involvement in Yemen, etc. That is not to say that there isn't a basis for it. But the aim is not to fix the missile program. The aim is to get a new Chapter 7 resolution in the UN in order to once again put Iran in isolation and shift the balance of power back to the side of the Israelis and the Saudis. Do we have a question over here? It's my understanding that Saudi Arabia and Iran are uh, as enemies as you can get. That's just what I've read. And there seems to be a lot of change going on in Saudi Arabia. So how does that affect what's happening in Iran? Um, first part of your question is absolutely true. Unfortunately, it's a very, very bad relationship. It's a relationship that has gotten much worse in the last 10 years. There were some thaws back in the mid-1990s. Um, and there's also historical baggage, um, you know, ancient conflicts that go back 1,400 years. But when it comes to what's happening inside of Saudi Arabia, I, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical about much of the coverage. I think the Saudis have managed to get a tremendously generous coverage uh, because MBS is pursuing some reforms internally, economic reforms. I think that's all that's great to the extent that they actually can work. And I think there's a lot of young people in Saudi Arabia that would like to see those succeed uh, because of a very, very restrictive society. But I, I fear that this has been used a little bit to take attention away from some of the other things that Saudi Arabia is doing, such as the war in Yemen, which the US is complicit in, uh, which has created the biggest uh, humanitarian crisis right now. Uh, but also, you know, kidnapping the Lebanese prime minister and things like that. You know, on, on the foreign policy front, MBS is extremely reckless. And one way for him to be able to balance that out is to get a lot of good coverage because of talk about reform. If that reform is done, that would definitely be good. Um, whether it will be done to the extent that is said, I don't know. But it shouldn't come at the expense of putting attention on some of the other things that Saudi Arabia is doing. I have to say personally, I think, if I can leave you with one positive thing here today, <laughs> I would say some of the things going on inside of Iran I find far more interesting in the sense of where that society is going. Um, we hear a lot about the presidential elections. The presiden presidential elections in Iran are not free nor fair. You have a body called the Guardian Council that vets candidates based on criteria that they don't even make public. It's a highly undemocratic feature. You roughly have 1,000 people running for president. Only six or seven are allowed to stand. On a local level, however, the Guardian Council is not involved, doesn't even have the capacity to be able to vet every candidate. So on the local council elections, which are very important because the local council elect the mayors, and mayors are pretty important in Iran, you actually have much more of a direct uh, um, situation with uh, more direct democracy with far less interference. 
There we're seeing some very interesting things because we actually see the manifestation of what the society itself wants, not what the government, what the society wants. So for instance, in the last elections, uh, which was in uh, May of 2017, May or June, uh, the number of women being elected to seats in the city council tripled. In the very, very conservative city of Mashhad, you had a woman run on a platform of opposing the patriarchy. Her slogan was, elect more women. She won. So you're seeing developments there that is frankly happening in spite of the government, that if they can be allowed to continue, I think will uh, drive the country in a much, much more moderate direction. And you also have the expression of their immense frustration, which we saw in December with the protest. And those were both political and economic. The economic basis is very, very strong. You have tremendous income uh, and wealth inequality in Iran right now, probably worse than it was during the time of the Shah. You have a tremendous amount of mismanagement and corruption, which is not mainly, but at least partly, well, actually perhaps mainly, as a result of the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, being deeply involved in the Iranian economy right now. That is fueling corruption. Moreover, in this, in this last budget that Rouhani presented, he was pursuing essentially neoliberal austerity measures in which he was cutting fuel uh, um, uh, subsidies, he was raising fuel prices. Some of those things are not necessarily bad, but when doing it in a situation in which unemployment is already rising, investments are not coming in because of the uh, sanctions on CERN that I mentioned, it is creating a tremendous amount of displeasure combined with expectations that things would have be moving in the right direction. But I would say that the protests actually already have been successful to a certain extent. They have died down for now. I'm sure they will erupt again unless the government starts responding to some of their demands. But one thing that was very interesting that has happened that I personally never thought would happen is that Rouhani managed to utilize the protests to pressure the conservative establishment and the supreme leader and convince him that the IRGC needs to divest from the economy. And he issued a decree saying that the IRGC needs to do this. If this then happens, because implementation, of course, is everything, if it happens, it is actually a very, very significant development. It certainly will help with the corruption, but it will also help reduce the very strong influence that the IRGC, which is some of the most conservative elements of that uh, government, reduce the influence they have because so much of their influence is precisely because of the type of a mafia control over the economy that they're having right now. You answered my two questions in the last uh, second here. I was going to ask you, <laughs> uh, um, my understanding was that uh, the vast uh, population of Iran, except for all the, uh, the anti-Iranian policies we hear about in the United States, but most of the the general population is very pro-Western. And in, in many respects, their population is closer to the West than the other Arab countries. And that somehow we could uh, you know, break this, uh, this, this enmity between us that uh, the Iranians really are closer to the West than, than the other Arab countries. That was one question. The other one was the fact How that Iran, Iran has been <laughs> Is so successful now with getting uh, taking over Iraq and uh, and now into Syria, and with Hezbollah and uh, uh, and with their link their linkage throughout that area, that there is a dichotomy breaking you know building up between the Saudis, Egypt, and the Israelis, and the potential for war between those two power groups. I you know I wanted to hear your opinion on that sure. as well. Thank you so much. Uh, on to your first question. Well, Iran is not an Arab country, but you're quite right. The population um, tends to be quite positive towards uh, the American people, uh, American culture, American values, not necessarily American foreign policy, but they have no difficulty in their minds to love a country but dislike its policies because that's pretty much the approach they have to their own country. They love their own country, but they're very, very critical of many of its own policies. Um, and one of the things that we have to be careful with that is that if you take a look at many of the countries that are allies of the United States, we have really horrific numbers when it comes to the approval of the United States. I mean, a country like Turkey, I think it was 
11% uh, in a poll that was done, I think it was 2008 and 2009. Jordan, I think, was as low as nine. I mean, Jordan's security is completely dependent on the United States. Almost by accident, perhaps because the, the Iranian government has bad relations with the US, uh, US has much better favorability inside of Iran. I fear, however, that that will change dramatically if this does lead to a military confrontation. And, and having these populations actually having a positive view of the US is very critical. It's essentially America's soft power. Its ability to be able to have influence in those countries without using hard power. Uh, so it's very critical that when we, whether accidental or not, have those type of strategic assets that we're careful about them, not to, not to waste them. But your point is absolutely correct. This is a society that is far more compatible with Western values uh, than most of the countries in the region, save Israel. Um, and uh, it is one of those countries in which if you have a regime change in Saudi Arabia, for instance, right now, part of the reason why the House of Saud is relatively safe is because most countries are terrified, not because they like the House of Saud and its policy, but they're just terrified of what would follow House of Saud. What that society would produce is probably something more radical than what the House of Saud itself has been. In Iran, you have the opposite situation. You have a society that is light years ahead of the government and holds values that are much closer to Western values than what the government does. There's a question over On here. And a then quick answer to your second question as well. Um, there is a very dangerous situation. You're quite correct on that. But it is not a new alignment. This alignment between Israel, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Egypt has existed for about 10 years. It's just open right now. It's much, much more open. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier on. They have common interests. They've set aside their differences over Israel-Palestine. Because they have a common interest, they don't want to see a balance of power in the region in which Iran is not isolated. They do not have the capacity of balancing Iran on their own. They can only do so by having the U.S. involved. And this is where you have a potential divergence between U.S. interest on one hand and Saudi and Israeli and Egyptian interest on the other hand. This is part of the reason why they were very negative towards Obama. Obama's analysis was that at the end of the day, the United States... Um, has to take a look around the world and it has to ask itself, what is the strategic value of these various regions? And the strategic value of the Middle East, I think quite objectively we can say, is much less today than what it was 40 years ago. Partly because of, of course, the shale oil explosion here in the United States, the value of that oil is much less than what it was. Combine that with the fact that the cost of hegemony in the Middle East now has skyrocketed. Because it was one thing to be the hegemon of a region. It wasn't a great region, perhaps, but great states, but they were actually functional states. You have three failed states in the region right now. Being the hegemon of a region with three failed states is a completely different cost proposition. So lower value, higher cost. And then you have to combine the global perspective here. The United States, as a sole superpower, has to keep its eye on the ball. And what is that ball? To make sure that there is no peer competitor that emerges that can challenge the US on a global scale, not on a regional scale, on a global scale. There is no country in the Middle East, regardless of whatever their ambitions may be, that has the capacity of challenging the United States on a global scale. They can challenge the US on a regional scale, but not on a global scale. Rest assured, it's not the Houthis in Yemen that one day is gonna replace the US as a superpower. East Asia, however, definitely has a state that has the capacity and will probably develop the intention, motivation, to challenge the US on a global scale. So the question is, the longer the US is involved in a region that is becoming increasingly marginal, ends up in these endless wars in that region that is sucking its energy away from the challenge that will come in this century, in the next decade or two, in East Asia. So that's why he wanted to pivot to Asia. He wanted to reduce the US's involvement in the Middle East and shift more resources and focus towards China because that's where the real challenge will come. The Iran deal was a big piece of this. The only factor that actually could suck the US back into war in the region was the Iran nuclear program. Right or wrong, Obama resisted going into Syria. We can debate whether that was right or wrong, but nevertheless, we know he could resist it. On the nuclear deal, he didn't think that he could. He either had to resolve it or go to war. So it was important to get it resolved because if it went to war, it would further weaken the US when it came to facing 
uh, China down the road. Now, if you are Saudi Arabia, if you are Israel, you don't think the region has lost strategic value? To you, it hasn't. What they're doing is completely rational from their perspective. If you have the capacity of having a superpower come in and fight your battles and make sure that you, they tip the scale so that you are in a much more powerful position vis-a-vis -vis your rivals, who wouldn't do that? But what the conversation we're not having in Washington is, okay, is this really in the interest of the United States? Or have we become so embedded in some of the alliances that we have forgotten what our interest is and we're running more and more to uh, pursue their interests? We have time for about one more question here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, speaking to uh, the Jeffrey uh, Sterling story, I think that had something to do uh, with uh, the JCPOA being pushed through also. And also, um, speak to, you talking about Oman, also with Qatar, uh, they gave the Human straight control of that to Iran. That was another situation that they had to look at also. And also, uh, I would also like to say that as far as, as Iran is concerned and the JCPOA, the, uh, the controls that are, are moving that right now, they are putting in structures for uh, the elimination of Iran moving through uh, the system, SWIFT system, which is what it boils down to. Because as we know, Iran now has uh, diversed themselves from any use of the US dollar, which is a concern, which is another concern that, that they're trying to alleviate. And by doing that, that alleviates the US uh, Treasury bonds, which also China has a mark in that also because China is helping using the convertible bonds to push everybody else through along with Germany. Now, as far as what I would like to know from you is this, um, seeing that Iran is coming out, in your opinion, or what you see, if they're, become, if they're gonna become a, as they would say, a, a, a more powerful uh, sovereign nation in that, in that region, in which I, I see them doing that, I, I don't see anybody taking them on because I don't see um, Saudi Arabia taking Iran on because they can't take down Yemen, so I don't see them in any way possible going through Iran. Where would you see that economy right now? Because right now, the way their economy is right now, there's like 48,000 reals to one US dollar. So when and how do you see that changing on that scope and how soon? And also on the 21st through the 23rd, they're supposed to be, um, which is what to, uh, today, well, tomorrow and through the 23rd, there's supposed to be a vote on releasing Iran from uh, uh, a risky terrorist list and, and the FATA rules for international basal rules. So I'd like to hear what you say on that. All right, thank you so much. A bit technical, I'll do my best. Um, on, on the first issue that you mentioned um, about the Iranians moving away from the dollar, um, as part of the financial sanctions, uh, the Iranians could not trade in dollars at all. So they had to shift all of their uh, exchanges into other currencies. And this has had a backlashing effect as well because once the United States for the first time really used the international financial system as its own instrument of power, everyone knew that this could happen. But what it does is that it creates incentives for others to create alternative financial systems that would not be subjected to uh, the control of the United States. And one of the things that has happened is that the more difficult the Iranians have had to be able to move westwards, save uh, Europe, they're becoming more and more and more and more integrated with Russia and particularly China. Strategically for the United States, this is going to be a major problem because this is not an unimportant country at the end of the day. Uh, and, and this is, again, one of those things that we have to look, look beyond the region. We have to look beyond ballistic missiles and actually take a look from, from a global perspective and, and try to see, okay, these various moves that may have a good tactical motivation, what is it doing for us in, in a strategic sense? And I think we're seeing a clear backlash when it comes to how these sanctions have affected other countries' uh, calculations and, and how they're now incentivized to use to create their own financial systems and, and channels. Uh, when it comes to FATWA, that's a very important thing. So the, this is an entity that essentially will make an assessment as to whether 
to sim put it simply, the standards of Iran's banking system, if it's moved in the right direction, etc. It's supposed to be technical. It has unfortunately become very, very politicized. There's a lot of pressure on them to say that Iran hasn't. There's reasons that the Iranians haven't lived up as much as they should, but there definitely has been movement in the right direction. But if they don't get out of a bad rating from FATF, it's going to be even more difficult for them to be able to um, uh, attract foreign investments. But there's one option that they have left, an option that didn't exist 10 years ago, but does it exist today. And that is um, one of the main strategic assets of the United States is, and the West as a whole is no longer unique to the West. And that is the, the one that they still have is technology. The technology that the West offers is far superior to what the Chinese can offer. But the other one that the West used to have is financing. Now the Chinese have entered into the financing game as well, and the Iranians are turning more and more towards the Chinese to finance the various projects, etc., which further deepens them into China's orbit, um, uh, which again makes it more complicated for the U.S. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.